My top story of today's show. This week we saw migrants barricade their hotel accommodation in central London, Pimlico, because they said the rooms were unsafe. Asylum seekers were seen protesting on the street. There they are, because they had to share rooms at the Pimlico Comfort Inn. One of the migrants said they were being treated like animals. The hotel has since agreed to a maximum of only two migrants sharing a room. Earlier this morning, GB News spoke to Immigration Minister Robert Jenrick, who disagreed with the asylum seekers' actions. Remember, these are migrants who have said they are destitute. They've said that they have absolutely nowhere to stay, no friends, no family, no money, and the taxpayer is stepping up and providing them with good quality accommodation and board and lodgings. And so, you know, those, I think those migrants are wrong to protest and say that they deserve to have single uh, bedrooms with ensuite bathrooms and so on. And I'm pleased to see that common sense seems to have prevailed in this case. So there we go. That's what the minister in charge of all this has to say. But joining me now is the director for the Centre for Migration and Economic Prosperity, Stephen Wolfe, and international human rights lawyer, David Haig. Thank you very much indeed for joining me. Stephen, your reaction to what we saw early in the week, the protest outside this particular hotel, do you think that uh, Robert Jenrick is right to say these people are claiming that they are destitute, that they are fleeing war and persecution. So essentially, they should be grateful for what they've got. Well, there's no doubt that if they're claiming asylum, they are claiming that they are fleeing war uh, and, and they are fleeing torture and fleeing circumstances in their country which would make it intolerable for them to live. And therefore, one would expect them and hope that they would feel grateful at whatever country that took them in and was seeking to give them asylum was providing the accommodation, the legal uh, uh, legal assistance and medical care that a government that has signed to the UN Convention is required to give them. And so far it thinks, and I think that most of the British people will see them as being utterly ungrateful for the provision of a hotel in the middle of Pimlico where houses and flats are in the region of two million pounds, where there's a nice park that sits opposite that particular uh, hotel, and where they can wander around London and enjoy the sights that many would have to pay a fortune to do. So I do think that in these circumstances, they should be a little bit more grateful. Uh, and I think the public of Britain would actually support that view too. Yes, I think you're probably right. But David, a lot of these people, these migrants who are staying in this accommodation, have likely been there for a very, very long time. Of course, they cannot work. They don't have very much to do at all. And yes, they may be in central London, but it's not exactly like they're going to be enjoying the theatre scene or shopping in Oxford Street or whatever. Do you think there is, do you think there is, there's, there is something to be said that actually they shouldn't be crammed in this kind of accommodation for to a room for such a long, extended period of time. Good, good afternoon, Emily. I think, as Stephen mentioned, the, the, the UN Convention, I mean, there is the, the law is very clear into what well, the law states that we need to house people um, when, 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 when they're destitute. So that's the first thing. And that housing obviously should be safe. And we come on to when, the, when we look at the government with Maniston and, and diphtheria outbreaks, how they've been unable to manage things like that. Now, you know, I think it's, you know, I saw earlier on Robert Jenrick uh, basically talking about it's wrong that we're spending millions um, on housing asylum seekers every day. And I agree with that, it is wrong, but why are we in that situation? We've got a government that's been there for 13 years. Migration is not a new problem. Asylum seekers and people coming across the channel is not a new problem. Why are we putting them now in hotels? Why are we down the road from where I am in Falmouth, they're, they're outfitting a barge? Why were these procedures not done before? Why did it get to this stage where we're now at the mercy of illegal immigrants um, coming over and people and criminals and um, uh, uh, and, and uh, unscrupulous hotel and, and private landlords. The situation we're in is very much the making of the Tory party. Mm. Stephen, in terms of this policy, it seems that Robert Jenrick and the government have a policy to maximise the use of hotels. And what I mean by that is to essentially have more people 
in fewer rooms and to basically cut the costs for the taxpayer, which is absolutely fair enough. But this particular hotel has given in to, uh, well, these protests and said, no, 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 we'll just have two to a room then um, because of the backlash, etc., etc. So the government is desperately trying to squeeze in more and more migrants into this accommodation. Um, but then you have a you have very upset people and it just doesn't seem to work at all. David's got a point there. Why isn't the government processing these claims quicker? Is there some kind of ulterior motive here to keep these asylum process so long? No, I don't think there is an ulterior motive to keep the process so long. There are two particular reasons, uh, fundamental reasons. There are several others, but the, the main two reasons of why the processing is a backlog now. I think the last figures are about 142,000 asylum applications in the backlog is firstly because of the demand. We have certainly seen a huge increase in those average numbers that were coming across from low 30,000s at the beginning of uh, 2010 to where we are now, which is approaching 48,000 a year coming into the country and certainly expecting 80,000 this year. So there's a huge demand numbers. And secondly, from COVID onwards, we've had a decrease in the supply of those being able to undertake the roles of assessing at the asylum applications. There's been technical issues too. There's been problems that have led to the fact that we need this large scale accommodation. And the government is quite right. They have a fiscal duty to actually reduce the cost on the taxpayer because with over 460 hotels being used across the country, there is a need to actually maximise space. And that's why we're seeing uh, Manston, yeah. we're seeing other areas now being used. I mean, David, I think the public are absolutely sick and tired. I mean, I can't talk about the whole public in its entirety, but a lot, a lot of people are absolutely fed up. You have local authorities who are t told days in advance, if that, that suddenly there are going to be hundreds of migrants in a local hotel. They then have to deal with all the demands on the local infrastructure, school places, NHS appointments, et cetera, et cetera. Roads even, bus services even, and everything that goes with having extra people at the last minute. How long can this go on before people actually... Well, until all hell breaks loose, really. I mean, it has got to that point, especially when you see people complaining about accommodation in Zone 1 in central London, where people who have been paying taxes their entire life couldn't even dream of being able to afford to live. It, it is crazy. I, I mean, I agree with you. I mean, you, 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 I clearly remember over Christmas time, we saw a lot of homeless people losing um, accommodation, which they would have generally been put in over Christmas because it was given to asylum seekers. So people, you, you know, that, that's something I think which, uh, in addition to what you said, made, makes people very angry. The problem that we've got is the government is continually failing to get a grip on, on, the, on the problem. Each and every day, it's literally almost every day, every other day, we're seeing another publicity stunt, another policy going through, but none of them have actually gone through. Nothing's really been done other than policy announcements and, and we're hurtling towards another general election. Mm. And so I don't see, I really don't see it changing. I think David, we're going to see more and more of these headlines. David, sorry to interrupt you. You're an international human rights lawyer. To what extent are lawyers to blame for holding up policy? We see time and time again the government being well being forced to backtrack essentially on things like the rwanda policy on the fact that people can uh, use legal aid time and time again to um to essentially stop themselves from being deported for xyz reason they come back and claim another thing whether it's family rights etc whatever it is whatever the reason is that they wish to stay here and they wish to use the legal process to do so how much are lawyers to blame activist lawyers I think every, I think everybody. There's a lot of people in the scenario that are to blame, including activist lawyers, because activist lawyers and certain NGOs people obviously have different opinions on how we should treat asylum seekers. Some of those people are the ones that are challenging the various deportations and the policies that we're seeing going through the courts that are delaying things. But at the end of the day, the government should have been prepared for these. So why did they push through legislation that they must have known when they drafted it was going to get stuck in these? in these scenarios. That seems to me a, a ridiculous situation for them to do. So yes, your lawyers are to blame, but it, again, I think the book stops at the government. Well, there you go, Stephen, just the government to blame then. No, I, I think it's entirely the government's uh, fault in this circumstances. The government is trying to do the best it can, but they, they do have made mistakes and they're not able to undertake some of the things that are needed to, for example, removing sufficient numbers of illegal migrants and those also who have committed crimes. 
There is problems, as David has quite read, readily said, that there are some activist lawyers. But as an immigration barrister, we can't blame all the legal profession or the judges because that's the laws. And it is their job to try and represent individuals. But of course, charities and NGOs don't seem to have the same sort of understanding of government policy because they oppose that government policy. And therefore, there is a political aspect to it as well. And I think a lot of politics is involved in this. So there are many parties to blame. I also blame the fact that the international community has not come together to have some form of new treaty that deals with the fact that the International Convention on Human Rights and also the F Refugee Conventions doesn't recognise genuine refugees compared to now a large number of economic migrants. I think that needs to change too. And Stephen, just on that, very lastly, we've seen lots of reports this week over the course of the week about the government trying to make agreements with various countries. One of the latest is Georgia. Essentially, anyone who has passed through Georgia or who has come through Georgia to this country via the channel can be then deported back. What kind of progress are we making when it comes to schemes like that? Well, this is the government now trying to go around one of the big issues that they have is that they can't get treaties with some of the biggest countries of suppliers of illegal and genuine asylum seekers, which is Iran, Iraq, Afghanistan. And then you've got countries like Somalia and even down to number 10 in the group is China. And they are passing through these countries. So this is their attempt to try and find a way of another Rwanda. Whether it will work is, again, down to the language they use, the legislation that they pass. But ultimately, as I say, there does need to be a new international convention where people come together and start deciding how we deal with the large scales of economic migrants, which I may add, the UN and the European Union have said now amounts to about 60 percent of all people coming into mm. the countries. Mm. Just lastly, David, you, sh you were nodding, nodding your head there. We've seen from some of the latest statistics that now India is one of the biggest countries in terms of uh, people coming from there via the channel. It seems like we're always chasing the next problem, the next country that's coming, the next, uh, the next uh, group of migrants that's coming. Do we now need another scheme with India to be able to send people back who come from there? Because India is a safe country. Well, absolutely. I mean, we are, you, you, you hit the nail on the head. We're always chasing, but we, we need a government that prepares, you know, one that's ready for these, uh, the, the, these problems before they happen. And I don't see that changing at the moment. We already saw even with India, you know, Braverman making comments which, which riled relations with India. So we, we have a serious problem and it's, gonna, it's going to continue until they actually grapple with the issue and, and, and get, get, the, get the immigration figure the, and immigration sorted out once and for all. Thank you very much indeed, David Hay, international human rights lawyer, and Stephen Wolfe, of course, director of the Centre for Migration and Economic Prosperity. It's hard not to sit here and think, how hard can it actually be to sort this out? I know a lot of people think, you know, just, just turn the boats around. But of course, there are many complexities to that, not least international law. But please do send in your views on that conversation. What you make of all the protests outside that central London hotel. The hotel ended up giving in to their demands. Only two to a room now. Is that fair? Or do we need to just squeeze in as many people? Should we even be using hotels? I'm not sure what's happened with the barge, but perhaps we can get an update on that Later, you can get lots more on this story on our website, of course. Simply head to gbnews.com. You'll find the best analysis and opinion, as well as all of our latest breaking news of every story under the sun. You're watching and listening to G.